Good evening. Thank you so much, Larry, for inviting me to be a part of your conference. It's really an honor. I uh, can't thank you enough. I'm humbled to be here. And um, I just want to share with you all a little bit about how I came to be here, where I am today. And so I'll tell you a little bit about my life and my family and the work that I do. And at any time, feel free to ask questions. <laughs> I, I'm happy to respond to questions. So uh, I am an enrolled member of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, and I'm also Santee Sioux. I descend from Chief Smokemaker. Can you hear me all in the back? OK. Some of you may have heard about Chief Standing Bear of the Ponca in the trial of 1879, where we were first recognized as humans. I do not descend from Standing Bear, but from one of his colleague chiefs, Chief Smokemaker. My grandfather was born in 1878. He was the last chief of the second rank of the Ponca tribe. And our tribe is in northeastern Nebraska along the Niobrara River. My mother was born in 1913 up on the reservation. And my grandmother came from Morton, Minnesota, my Santee grandmother. She was born in 1893. So she came down and lived over on the Santee uh, reservation and went to the Santee Normal Training School. My mother at a young age went to the Genoa Indian School in Genoa, Nebraska, which was oh, a couple hours away from the reservation. And that was one of the many schools throughout America that was a military school t charged with killing the Indian and saving the man. So uh, thank goodness <laughs> they weren't totally <laughs> successful. And um, so my mother, while she was at the school, along with some of her siblings, she had uh, seven sisters and one brother, uh, she learned the three R's and she learned a trade. And her trade was cooking. So. That's what she did the rest of her life until a week before she died at the age of 58. But after she was at the school, uh, she didn't graduate. She had to go home to help uh, my grandmother with the, the younger children. And she had little uh, sisters uh, that were, my aunt was like 17 years younger than my mother. So she went back home to the reservation at a time in America when white women weren't in elected office, my mother was an elected tribal councilwoman. So she served on the council uh, up on, on the reservation. But as, as many of you know in America, for Indian people after the allotment era, my grandfather's allotment was just down the river from Standing Bears and his mother's and his brother's. And they were just very tiny plots of land. And our tribe was a small tribe and we, were really struggling and we were very poor and we weren't doing very well. And so uh, my mother decided to be, um, as some people call, trailblazer. Uh, she decided to leave the reservation and go to a little town to try to uh, make a better way for her, uh, my oldest three siblings. Uh, because of a lot of uh, domestic violence that was happening on the reservation and poverty. She left with my grandmother and moved to the town where I was born along. I have 10 uh, siblings, and so I was born first generation off reservation, and I'm an urban Indian, as many Indian people are. And my mother found a job in Norfolk, Nebraska, um, as a cook in a little cafe. And when she came to Norfolk, um, the community was a German community, all white community. And there really wasn't any place at the inn, as we say, for Indian people. No one wanted to rent or to Indian people. There was only one place where my mother could find housing for my eldest um, <coughs> siblings and my grandmother and her. And that was in a salvage junkyard. The man that owned this property was an African American. His name was Henry Jones. And he had a very lucrative business uh, selling uh, salvage goods. He sold it to this gentleman who was a Jewish man, and they both made a really nice living. 
So I often tell people <laughs> that don't know me um, that <clears throat> I'm a junkyard dog. <laughs> don't mess with me. <laughs> I, grew, I didn't grow up on the res, I'm not a res girl, but I'm a junkyard dog. And so <laughs> I grew up in poverty. I lived in a three room house with an outhouse and my 10 siblings, my grandmother always lived with us. and many aunts and their children. It was always different people coming. Uh, until I was 10, we had the outhouse and I slept in the kitchen in a little twin rollaway bed that we folded up every morning before we went to school with my grandmother, who lived to be 86, and my little sister. And I always had to be, my grandmother's feet were always in my face. <laughs> but that was okay, I loved my grandmother. She was just really wonderful and it was great to have her and so when my grandmother and her came to Norfolk, they took turns, one would work and the other one would take care of the children. Back at a time when white women really weren't working. So in many ways, my mother did a lot of things that uh, I learned from and um, gave me gifts of leadership in descending from Smoke Maker and her father and then being brave and coming to this uh, white community so going to school as a young girl, the um, majority of the students were white and then there were some natives and I was mostly related to all the natives in, in town and it was, it was challenging being the only native kid in school and you, every year you waited for the teacher to say the racist things and you know you knew before the year was out that the shoe would fall and that was going to happen. And, but um, somehow I, I liked school and what I'd like to say to all of you students that are here, half the battle you've already won because you're here and showing up is half of it. So getting to school is really levels the playing field and it gives you tools and critical thinking skills to be a good human being. And getting an education is not a white thing. So we learn traditional as well as all that we have to so that we can I say learn all the rules and beat them at their their game. So, so that's um, when I started to school. I didn't know that I was poor, you know, living in this little world that I lived in. But I had a friend who her father was a dentist, and I played with her, and she was nice, and go over to school after her to, to her house. And well, I was lactose intolerant. I didn't drink milk, and her mother offered us graham crackers. I never saw a graham cracker in my life, and she had a bedroom with two beds in it. And I, that just really blew my mind. Two beds. I said, well, who, Jan, who lives, sleeps in that bed? And she said, no one. I said, seriously? Really? I thought, hmm, this is different. <laughs> because I was going to go home and get in that little rollaway bed with my grandmother and my sister. So then I started seeing, geez, I, my life is really different. But I was as good a student or better than Jan was. And I had a lot of things she didn't have a lot of love. She had a, a sister and a brother, very strict parents, and she didn't have the extended family like I had. And so onward I went and I made it through school. And some of you I know are going to tribal colleges. Well, I started out at a community college in Norfolk. I had a forensic scholarship. In high school, I was in debate and oratory, and I believe that much of that came as a gift from my relatives. And so I had, and in my family, in my dysfunctional family, I was kind of the mascot person that kept everybody uh, distracted and entertained. <laughs> that was kind of my job. And uh, many times when those people came to our home trying to look for ways to take us away from my mother, the welfare people, I was given the job to sit down on the sofa with my grandmother and these, this man and woman that always came to our house. Now I know what I was doing, but I didn't know then. They were checking us out. They were looking to see if these kids were really okay. It was it safe where we fed and all that. So I, would, um, <laughs> I was quite precocious and I would visit with this man and Mrs. Manifeld was the lady's name. I remember her. And now I think back, you know, that was, that was what I did. And I guess I did a pretty good job because they never took us away. <laughs> so, so I went to the community college and um, my mother died when I was 19. And she was born in 1913, not as a citizen of the United States of America. 
because we didn't become citizens until 1924. And when she died, our tribe was one of those tribes that was terminated in 1962. The Ponca tribe was terminated. And we weren't restored until 1990. So at the time of my mother's death, I remember uh, when that whole thing in 66 was when uh, the final phase of that happened. It was really quite a thing to have happen, to be terminated. And so at my mother's death, she was no longer technically an Indian. But just because you're terminated doesn't mean you're not Ponca. My grandfather followed my mother down to Norfolk, and he lived next door in a little one-room shack of sorts. And he wasn't a Christian. He was um, a traditional Ponca uh, person, and he had a pipe that he kept. It was a wooden floor, not like this parquet floor, but he would pick up, you could pick up one thing, and that's where he kept his pipe. Really, you know, how our religion had to go underground. Well, that's where it went, underground. And he would have all these elder friends of his that would come visit from the reservation, and there was a train. And my grandfather was a chief of the second rank, but nobody in the town I lived in knew that. It was as though all of that was invisible. And my mother was a facilitator to all the Indian people that came to Norfolk. She would help them find, whether it was for a funeral, uh, an attorney, <laughs> whatever it was, but no one knew about that my mother was what I thought was really special. And I didn't even know that my mother had been on the tribal council. I knew that my grandfather was really special. I think I knew that he was a chief, but with that you just didn't talk about those kind of things. My grandfather also did something that wasn't legal and wasn't allowed. He made beer. <laughs> he was really a good beer maker. He had a great big crock. And as a little girl, my job, I helped my grandfather. And my job was to shoo the flies away from the beer. He had this big metal, sometimes he used cheesecloth, and he had this metal thing that was over it, like a screen, kind of like a screen. He also dried corn, so I would help him with drying corn. And uh, when I was six years old, my grandfather keeled over dead in our one room, living room home, uh, sent my brother, who was kind of his favorite, out of the room to get his spittoon because he didn't, he knew he was going to die and he didn't want my brother to see him. So I had found a little bird in my grandfather's bed a couple months before he died and I thought that was such a funny thing and I told my mother, you know, being the funny little girl that I was, and I told my grandpa and he said that, well, that's uh, the messenger that I'm going to be going on. And so my mother made him his last cake because she went to the Genoa Indian School and she could bake a great angel food cake and then my grandfather left us. So then my mother left us. My grandmother lived on to be 86 and I went to that little um, Norfolk, Northeast Nebraska Community College, got married, had two daughters, got a divorce. <sighs> All of a sudden I had to figure out what I was going to do to take care of my two daughters and myself and I decided like I told you, half of life is showing up and education is important and I knew that I had to empower myself with skills. So uh, our tribe was restored in 1990 and about that same year NAGPRA kicked in, the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act. So I got a job with the Ponca tribe working as a little peon secretary in the Lincoln office at 33rd and Pioneer and I went back to college. And I found a college that was comfortable for me as an adult, non-traditional student, as a mother with two little kids. And it was Doan College. Janice Hadfield, the dean, was just, just this wonderful lady that, much like my mother and my grandmother, I was really drawn to women. So that was a welcoming place. They accepted my old credits from Northeast, and so I went in as a junior. Transferable credits, that was really important. And I would work all day for the Ponca tribe. Some days I would drive uh, to Niobrara to our homelands, which was four hours away, at 8 o'clock in the morning, go to a meeting, and uh, then I would turn around, drive home, and go to class from 6 to 10. And I had my two daughters. By this time, they were in junior high and high school. And then get up in the morning and go to work. But that's what I had to do. And it isn't always easy to do these things. And I've told my daughters, you know, it doesn't fall out of the sky. You've got to get up and do it. 
and that's what my mother did every day with us all of us children it was hard work and she died partly because she couldn't afford to take her medication because there was no Indian Health Service for us and so it was feed us or take her medication and so that was that so I got my bachelor's degree in human relations and prior to doing that uh, I applied to be the director of the Indian Commission now it was 22 years ago today I don't think somebody with an associate's degree would get the job but I truly believe that it was by the grace of God that I got the job because my ancestors were looking down and they knew that I needed I needed help <laughs> I was desperate for to make a little more money than what I was making for the tribe and before I went over to working uh, at the Indian Commission I became the repatriation director for our tribe now our tribe never had that position because there wasn't a law the state of Nebraska was the first state to pass legislation on human remains and that was in 1989 with the Pawnee Nation's battle with the Historical Society and a good friend of mine Robert Paragoy was the attorney from NARF that managed all of that so um, I was tasked with dealing with human remains and typically women don't do that in most native cultures and so there was some kind of pushback and criticism that I did that but for me uh, it was a matter of survival and also that I felt like there was something that for some reason I was supposed to do this so so I did and nothing bad ever happened to me and hasn't since I started doing that so I think it was okay that I did that the only thing bad that happened uh, was um, I went to a conference down in, at Haskell Nations and I spoke about repatriation. And this was at the time of the Oklahoma bombing, so that can put it into your mind of when it was. I took an, an intern with me and we drove down there and when you go to conferences, kind of like you all are at a conference, you lose touch with what's going on in the world. You're all holed up in these rooms and talking to people and making connections. And so I was meeting all kinds of great people like uh, Dr. James writing in. He's a Pawnee friend of mine. He was there and uh, well I'd met him before but I told James I said well I'll speak only if I don't have to speak after you because you're too good and you have a PhD and I don't so so anyway that worked out that way. While we were there uh, this bombing we, we go home and we find out this has gone on and we were right on the same roads of the bomber you know it was so weird. Well I spoke at that conference and I was pretty young, <laughs> you know, 20, 22 years ago, and I didn't, you know, when you're young, you are braver, you are less fearful. The older you get, the more you start worrying about things, but you young people, you've got the, you think you're going to live forever, and that's a good thing, because we need people like that in America to do the things that as elders, you know, we're not as brave anymore. So I was a little maybe, I don't know if I was clueless, but I stood up and I spoke about what happened to our human remains. A professor had done invasive and destructive analysis on our human remains. Well, in the audience, uh, there was a gentleman that was a friend of his, and he came back home and told his friend, this professor that I saw over at Open Harvest a couple days ago, and whenever I see this professor, I have to leave his presence because he's very toxic to me. He knows me and I know him, and we're like, oh no, but he still lives here in town. So uh, he sued me. He, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, I'm having, I'm having all my family over for Thanksgiving dinner. There's a knock on the door, and there's a police officer, a sheriff. Lincoln Sheriff with these papers that he presents to me and he says um, you know sorry ma'am but <laughs> okay uh, I had been to the grocery store got the turkey and all the trimmings and my two daughters were helping me unpack the groceries and it was like five six o'clock at night I read this letter and it says oh wow that I was going to be sued for uh, slander and for the rest of my life all my life earnings well as women do you multitask and I said you know what I don't know what I'm gonna do about that but right now I have to get this Thanksgiving dinner for my family fixed so I said I'm gonna put that in the drawer and I'll think about that on Monday so 
critical thinking skills, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> so that I was learning at Doan College. So I did that. I had my family over, didn't tell a soul because I didn't want to spoil anybody's fun. I'm the mascot, remember. Have to make my family happy. And so on Monday, I spoke with our tribal chairman, Fred Leroy, and uh, he was involved in uh, getting our tribe restored. And so uh, I said, oh, what am I going to do? And a couple other people, and they said, well, you need to call NARF, Native American Rights Fund. There's a fellow there that might help you, Robert Paragoy, who had been the legal counsel here on the LB340. So I got his phone number, and I called him, and Robert Paragoy, uh, he was my hero, and he said, this is what I get up for in the morning to fight professors, white professors that are trying to intimidate our people. So he took my case uh, pro bono, and I was, he was successful because I was protected by sovereign immunity as an officer of my tribe that I was representing. And, um, but it was a real scary thing to happen, you know, and it was something that really, oh, I'll never forget. <laughs> And um, when you go through things like that, you know, being, growing up in a junkyard, <laughs> it helps you. <laughs> you know, scary people in the world, how do, you, how do you survive and what do you do to keep going? So uh, that was just at the same time as I was hired at, to be the director of the Commission on Indian Affairs. And we were in a contentious battle with the university over human remains. So I helped, let's see, I think I'm going way too long. I've got to hurry up here. Uh, <laughs> you guys got to get going. I know you're tired. Um, uh, we were involved with this big settlement. The university had human remains from tribes from all over the plains. It was just really unbelievable. Uh, so if you go on Centennial Mall, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to look at the new Centennial Mall. Our agency helped. I raised $140,000 to get the native footprint on that mall. And down in front of the Journalism College, there's a circle of tribal nations, 27 that were historic to the region. So we had a big settlement on East Campus, and there's a, a stone there, a memorial, um, that's a testimony to what was done to our elders, and uh, some of our remains were incinerated there. And so now, uh, in 2017, Nebraska will celebrate our sesquicentennial 150 years later. And I was um, really determined that we not forget that there were people here before then, cultures here, living cultures that existed. So I'm really happy and proud that we could make sure that uh, our stories are told. And so um, I guess to summarize, Let's see, I want to tell you so many things. In 21 years, uh, what I've been committed to is changing stereotypes about Indian people, giving our voices a place, our stories an opportunity be, to be told, empowering young people, protecting our elders. And I passed out a magazine to some on your tables. And there are many projects that I've been involved in. Uh, at the University of Nebraska, and one was I was an adjunct professor at the Journalism College, and we created uh, with a Carnegie Knight grant of 125,000 that first magazine, which focuses on Indian women all across the United States of America, and many from Nebraska. The second magazine uh, was a result of my taking the first magazine to the National Congress meeting out in D.C., and the chairman of the Muscogee Nation took that home to Oklahoma. And one of his tribal members, Jeanette Overall, saw the magazine and she said, oh my goodness, I've never seen uh, stories about us, real contemporary stories, you know. And myself as a child growing up, you look at these magazines and nobody looks like us, you know. So she said, I want a magazine like that. And she called the journalism college and we Skyped her in. And she donated $150,000 so we could do Native Daughters too. And both of those magazines have a curriculum that you can download on, off the internet. And uh, if you would like more copies, please contact uh, us and we can get you. We're almost out of Native Daughters 1, but Native Daughters 2 we have uh, more magazines for. So through those magazines, uh, we've had the opportunity to tell the stories of Indian women all around uh, America. And I'm so happy to see tonight that there are Native men here because it seems as though Native men are 
underrepresented in our cultures. Another great project, or uh, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, initiative at the university is the uh, Standing Bear Law School Scholarship. And we've had three women graduate and become attorneys, but not one man. And I'm trying to find some men. Uh, so if you know anybody out there in Indian country, it's a three-year full scholarship at the journalism college, or the law school. And uh, two of the girls that have graduated, both are Oglala Sioux, Lakota, from uh, South Dakota. One is uh, Andrea Miller. She practices family law in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Uh, the second graduate was Jennifer Bear Eagle. And Jennifer was practicing law in Omaha at Frederick Peebles Morgan, Lance Morgan's law firm. You might have heard of Lance Morgan with Ho Chunk Inc. Very successful story. Uh, Jennifer, those two ladies are now on my board. And so they're my bosses. And in, Indian, in our culture, it's about the circle and reciprocity and giving back. Well, now uh, I assisted and helped those girls, and now they help me do my work. And so we have a really great relationship. And I'm really happy to share with you that Jennifer Bear Eagle has, uh, when she went to law school, it was her dream to go back and work for her tribe. And just uh, recently, she was hired by her tribe. November 9th will be her last day at Frederick Peebles, and November 14th will be her first day as general counsel to the Ogallala Lakota Sioux Nation. So I'm hoping that she will be helpful in our work with White Clay, Nebraska, which is a little town in western Nebraska where you may have read in today's Lincoln Journal Star a big story about what's going on with the Liquor Commission. And that's been something that since I started in my position, when I started my daughter Katie and I drove out to White Clay because I had to learn the whole state. I went out to all the reservations and I took Katie with me and she just got her driver's license. She got a speeding ticket on the way home. <laughs> but, so we drive through White Clay and you know it's kind of scary all by yourself two women and we didn't stop we had the doors locked because there are many of our relatives that are laying on the street intoxicated and just in a chronic state it was so sad so we went on to the reservation to Pine Ridge and we had some one of my commissioners was an attorney there and so they took us out gave us the full tour and all that so uh, Katie my daughter both of my daughters graduated from the University of Nebraska and my youngest daughter is a teacher and has two children and my oldest daughter went on to Columbia Law School. She had the Standing Bear Law School scholarship but she went down to the pre-summer law institute in Albuquerque that many of you know about and she was recruited and took the opportunity to go to Columbia and have a lot of debt. <laughs> uh, she could have had a full all paid but no she decided that she wanted to work on a national level and to do that she felt like Columbia was the place for her to go so for any of you that are afraid of going and leaving home she was we're a real close-knit family and she was kind of a shy girl and uh, never had a car till she was 20 years old uh, she had a stick shift car uh, didn't have a telephone now everybody has phones today but I told her your job is to go to school and someday if you go to school you'll be able to buy any kind of car you want but I want you to study and I'll worry about the other things and you may not have the fancy car now. So she went to Columbia Law School and she did very well and she went on to work at a small law firm, Sanosky Sachi Anderson. And she was chained to the table as when you start out in life, you pay your dues, you work really hard and she learned a lot working at that firm. And then an opportunity came for her to go to Aiken Gump, a larger international law firm where she really didn't intend to do water law, but somehow her boss said, I want you to work on this case. So she started working on that. She'd done more health law, but she worked on the Crow water settlement, and that was, uh, I think, $460 million settlement, and they were successful. And then she worked on the Osage settlement, another large settlement, and um, she currently is working with uh, Pechanga Nation, and she flies back and forth to Montana and implements all of the contracts for the Crow Nation. And last summer they had a great big ceremony out there. So uh, 
to tell you how life is uh, a big circle and what's really great about doing this for so long now I get to celebrate my daughter's victories and wherever I go people know my daughter <laughs> it's not about me at all and that's what parents want you want your children to do well so last summer uh, and I'm sorry I'm probably rambling on and uh, I'm off topic but okay so I was out at the Cheyenne Memorial I went out there to honor my friends and uh, their relatives with the Cheyenne outbreak that happened out there so I'm out there and I'm asked to give some remarks because the gentleman that helped with that was T.R. Hughes a longtime friend of mine and when Katie was little and we went out to White Clay we stayed at the Buffalo Ranch of T.R. Hughes so it was all like kind of coming home so after I'm through talking there were these young men uh, that said uh, in my remarks I talked about my daughter Katie Brossi and then they come over these big guys <laughs> they're the kills back boys does anybody know the kills back boys it's a really amazing family one's a pharmacist one's a professor at ASU uh, can't remember his name right now one's an attorney and one's the cultural director so they said you're Katie Brossi's mother <laughs> and I said yes I am and I'm very proud and honored you know when you go places and you hear nice things about your children it's sort of like that full circle thinking back to my mother who went to the Genoa Indian School and the goal was to kill the Indian and now my daughter is fighting for our people in Washington DC and she has a three-year-old little boy and her husband's Navajo and we have some Navajo in the room and uh, so of course we have a lot of Plains Indians and the Navajo Nation. Well, guess what? My grandson is in Rome. Ponca! <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys have uh, blood quantums. We don't. And down the road, you don't know what's going to happen in life. How you will, who you will marry. So my daughter has to anticipate that maybe her son won't marry a Navajo and the blood quantum and levels could get so. So that was the reason why. And my son-in-law is the head of the DC Navajo office and he just returned from Oxford England and had been there with the tribal chairman so it's really quite an amazing life that I've had and I still love what I do every year every other year I have a breakfast and this year it will be May 12th for 800 people come to my breakfast where we award scholarships to native students we've awarded over fifty thousand dollars of scholarships Two of my uh, graduates, one is a doctor from the Omaha tribe, Rosette Stabler. One is a Winnebago, Lucas LaRose. Uh, he is an attorney that went to ASU. So uh, it's really great when you look back and you see the people that you've mentored uh, through the journalism college. Tomorrow you're going to hear Rebecca Schlechting. She's from the Iowa tribe in Kansas. And I met her through another friend oh, about three years ago. And I was very impressed with her. I said, we've got to get this girl so I introduced her took her to dinner with my friend Joe St Rita professor and she was looking at going to Syracuse but we got her to go here and she had it's just been outstanding right now she's an adjunct professor at the journalism college working on a three semester class focusing on white clay so that is again you know such a great legacy that to see what she's going to do and the impact she will have so tomorrow you'll she'll probably share with you some of that and she's quite an amazing young woman I had another secretary that worked for me a young girl that uh, came to me oh I would say about seven years ago she graduated from the University of Nebraska and she wanted to work as a secretary in the Capitol but nobody was interested to hire her so she went away and had a Fulbright and we stayed in touch and then she called me when she got back and she said I had a secretarial position opened and she wanted to come and learn about Indian Affairs her mother had been taken away from her mother during the time of ICWA and three uh, her mother and three siblings were removed one day when grandma was home with the children and mom wasn't home the people came and then they took them to Omaha where they were put in a home and so her mother and the four of them were adopted by a rancher in western Nebraska a white family who attempted then to kill the the Indian so uh, Rachel didn't get to know much about her Indianness because her mother was the youngest and she totally went along with these people that 
saved her life and she couldn't remember her mother because she was very young two years old her eldest sibling was 12 and ran away because she could remember her mother so Rachel wanted to learn about what her mother wasn't going to tell her and you know those schools do a really good job of keeping secrets and that's what happened with me my mother never talked about the Genoa Indian School she would say yes she learned it was good she didn't say bad things but I could tell it was a sad kind of a sad place and so likewise with Rachel she became empowered and uh, she learned through working at our office about all these different facets she met so many great people and guess what she went on to law school at ASU and received her law degree and now she's clerking for a uh, state Supreme Court judge down in Arizona so another example of the many many people that because they got an education and believed that they could do it you know uh, can't never did a thing I remember the teacher told me that and that's what I always told my daughter so any of you here can do what you want to do you your dreams can become real and it and people want to help you and if you run into a roadblock and you think I can't do it I don't have the money or this or that call me up call your teacher we want to help we'll find ways to help you believe me I have a very small budget at the Indian Commission but I host a summer camp every summer for high school kids it costs fifty thousand dollars and I raise that money from private donations so I love to help people and it goes back to my mother helping when we had very little she always found a way to give so for our Indian people that's what we do and I know I've taken too much of your time and I, again I really am proud of all of you that you came all this way and I, I wish you all the best in your journeys in life and any, if there's ever anything I can do to help you just Google the Nebraska Indian Commission and I would be happy to try to help you and if anybody has a question I'd be happy to answer you probably all want to go home and watch uh, it's um, still baseball going on I'm not a big sports fan but I know the Cubs won yesterday <laughs> and I want to go home and watch the political I'm you know a political junkie <laughs> so. yes you talked about the Ponca tribe being terminated mm -hmm. and the now I think it's unterminated isn't it yeah. Oh yes, we, I forgot to mention that. Uh, well, I did sort of say that we were restored. Yeah. I did say we were restored in 1990. And so once again, the full circle of life, my sister, my elder sister, who retired from Pfizer Corporation, along with my eldest sister, who was 17 years older than me, uh, my sister ran for tribal council. And she was the vice chair of the Ponca tribe since we were restored simultaneously she went to work every day at Pfizer she had to be there by six in the morning till three o'clock clock in and clock out but she used all of her vacation days our tribe was restored without a land base under public law 101 484 uh, the state of Nebraska some of our congressional delegation didn't want another reservation uh, junk cars and all that one of the congressmen said and I'm not protected by sovereign immunity tonight so I have to be a little careful about what I say I don't want to be sued so we were restored without a land base and we have service areas uh, we have tribal members I would say geez around 3,000 and we have our headquarters up at Niobrara where we have our sacred uh, cemetery um, we have a buffalo herd we purchase land we can take up to 1600 acres in trust there we have an office here at, in Lincoln that's held in trust at 17th and E that I helped facilitate that process with interior uh, we have an office in Omaha where we have a wellness clinic that has traditional healing as well as Western medicine we have a, a Norfolk where I grew up has purchased the local Christian College and we own that property and so we have come a long ways and I serve as right now I'm the interim chair of the Ponca Gaming Enterprise Board I was the vice chair but the chair resigned so last night you know I took off my work hat and put on the other hat and I had to be on a teleconference with our tribal attorney and our tribe is trying to exercise our sovereignty to have a class 3 casino in Carter Lake Iowa we've had to go to uh, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals twice and we've won so we're waiting for the NIGC to make the decision and we're very hopeful that it will happen 
before the changing of the administration. So we've been hearing that, and this has been going on for nine years <laughs> and a lot of legal fees, but uh, we hope that if we have uh, gaming that we will do like many tribes have and it will show up our um, weak spots where we don't have enough for health, for education. And my job on the PGE is to determine where that money goes. And number one, I believe in education is the most important leveling agent. And so I would tie, if we ever get to a point where we would have per caps, the more education you get, the more money you get. And so uh, I think it's really important because without that, you don't have the critical thinking skills to really take care of your body, your, you know, your family, be a good citizen. So I, I think our tribe, we're a very small tribe, and, um, but we, uh, through the story of Standing Bear, we've had a lot of um, impact on Nebraska and uh, I think the country and we're very proud people and there are so many tribes in the United States of America and every one of us is unique and, but in some ways we have been galvanized by what's going on at Standing Rock, you know, because water is precious and to all of us. So sometimes we go to come together on human remains issues for our children, but then we compete economically. You know, that's just human nature. We don't, we agree to disagree. So, uh, <coughs> we have a trail, by the way, 19.5 uh, miles of trail from Beatrice to the border. Uh, Standing Bear was forcibly removed from Niobrara to Oklahoma, and his son Bear Shield died. He promised on his deathbed he would bring him back and bury him. So he came back and was arrested, taken to Fort Omaha, the trial, 1879. Judge Dundee said, ruled we were human. So uh, the Nebraska Trails Foundation raised a million dollars, and they repair, redid all of those, uh, the bridges on the trail, and put limestone. So now you can bike, run, walk, and they're deeding that to the Ponca tribe. That was actually 19.5 miles where Standing Bear and my relatives walked but we got to come back. Our Trail of Tears wasn't a dead end like so many others. Because of his bravery and honoring his word to bring his son back, the Ponca tribe were the Ushne Northern Coal Ponca, and we have the Southern Poncas. So, we go home. That's that. Thank you so much.